Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. Turkeys are probably, what, now defrosting as we speak? So let the turkeys defrost and let's get heated up by the Holy Spirit, right? All right, guys. Well, you already know this, but tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day. To me, one of our greatest national holidays, uh, a day we have set aside as a nation to uh, thank the Lord for all of His goodness and blessings which He has so richly given to us. You know, our, our nation was birthed in an attitude of thanksgiving to Almighty God for His providence that, you know, planted, sustained, and nurtured our fledgling nation from infancy to maturity as the strongest and most blessed nation on the face of the earth. Now, back in those early days, before we were even a nation, those early settlers were thankful to God, not for big houses or new cars, but for keeping them alive. Most of us are familiar with the tra traditional story of Thanksgiving, where in 1621, William Bradford of Plymouth Rock proclaimed a day of Thanksgiving to Almighty God for the survival of the pilgrims in their second year in the New World and for the abundant harvest he had provided with the aid of the native population. However, most people don't know the first Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving, didn't occur in 1621 uh, with this group of pilgrims who shared a dinner with a group of friendly Indians. The first recorded Thanksgiving actually took place a little more than 11 years earlier in Virginia. And guys, it wasn't a feast. You see, the winter of 1610 at Jamestown had reduced a group of 409 settlers to 60. 60. The survivors prayed for help, not knowing how, when, or where it would come from. They were in desperate straits, and they cried out to God. They had no other alternative just to trust God. And so they cried out to Him, and God worked a miracle. Uh, a, uh, a ship arrived out of nowhere uh, from England, filled with supplies and food. And uh, what they did was they held a prayer meeting to thank God. That was really the first Thanksgiving in the New World for um, these pilgrims. Now, you would think after seeing so many of their loved ones die due to the hardships of the New World that, you know, they wouldn't feel very thankful, but you would be mistaken. The uh, opposite was true. They realized they had much to be thankful for. Yeah, just to see the thought of seeing these 60 settlers who had lost, you know, almost 400 of their loved ones and friends um, kneeling there uh, in the snow, thanking God for saving them. I mean, probably is one of the most moving things we could ever imagine uh, in the new world. They were thankful for anything God gave them. You know, I like to compare the attitude of those early settlers to what we see in our country today. You know, the following, and I've read this before, but bear with me. The following is an article written by columnist uh, Craig Smith a few years ago. Uh, I think he pretty much sums it up what's going on today. Let me read it to you. Uh, Craig said, and I quote, A Newsweek poll alleges that 67% of Americans are unhappy with the direction the country is headed, and 69% of the country is unhappy with the performance of the president. In essence, two-thirds of the citizenry just ain't happy and want a change. So being the knuckle-dragger that I am, I started thinking, what are we so unhappy about? Is it that we have electricity and running water 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Is our unhappiness the result of having air conditioning in the summer and heating in the winter? Could it be that a large percentage of these unhappy folks have a job? Maybe that's what they're unhappy about. Maybe it is the ability to walk into a grocery store at any time and see more food in a moment than Darfur has seen all last year. Perhaps you are one of the 70% of Americans who own a home. You may be upset with knowing that in the unfortunate case of having a fire, a group of trained firefighters will appear in moments and use top-notch equipment to extinguish, extinguish the flames, thus saving you, your family, and your belongings. Or if while at home watching one of your many flat screen TVs, a burglar or prowler intrudes, an officer equipped with a gun and a bulletproof vest will come to defend you and your family against attack or loss. This all in the, in the, in the backdrop of a neighborhood free of uh, bombs and 
or malicious raping and pillaging the residents, neighborhoods where 90% of the teenagers own cell phones and computers? How about the complete religious, social, and political freedoms we enjoy that are the envy of everyone in the world? Maybe that is what has 67% of you folks unhappy. Fact is, we are the largest group of ungrateful, spoiled brats the world has ever seen. No wonder the world loves the USA, but has great disdain for its citizens. They see us for what we are, the most blessed people in the world who do nothing but complain about what we don't have and what we hate about the country instead of thanking the good Lord we live here, end quote. Why is this? I mean, what has turned us from being a thankful, being a nation thankful for the smallest blessings from God, you know, to being the complaining, self-indulgent, ungrateful people we have become, even though we are the most blessed nation on the face of the earth? Well, let me answer that question with a story I think will help to illustrate what has brought us to this place, to the place we are in in this nation. It goes like this. The story is told of two old friends that bumped into one another on the street one day. One of them looked forlorn, almost on the verge of tears. His friend asked, What has the world done to you, my old friend? The sad fellow said, Let me tell you. Three weeks ago, an uncle died and left me $40,000. That's a lot of money. Yeah, but two weeks ago, a cousin I never even knew died and left me $85,000 free and clear. Sounds like you've been blessed. No, you're an understanding interrupted. Last week, my great aunt passed away. I inherited almost a quarter of a million dollars. Now he was really confused. Then why do you look so glum? Well, this week, nothing. (laughs) Guys, that's the trouble with receiving something on a regular basis, even if it's a gift. Guess what? Eventually, we come to expect it. This is the entitlement mindset, I think, that has uh, permeated American society at almost every level. We've been blessed to live in a land of plenty. And uh, as a result, we have come to believe that these blessings are our rights, that we deserve them. In fact, many believe that we have earned them. And when that happens, we forget about God and focus on ourselves as being the source of our prosperity. In other words, we begin to take credit for what God has done. Now, this is exactly what happened in the Old Testament to Israel, even though God warned them to be on guard against this very thing before leading them into the Promised Land. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And I will read it to you out of the NLT, starting with verse 7, Deuteronomy 8, verse 7. Now, this is in preparation for God bringing them into the promised land. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water, with fountains and springs that gush out, into, gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley of grapevines, fig trees, and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that your plenty, excuse me, beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commandments, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Now, unfortunately, the Jewish people didn't listen to the Lord and allowed themselves to fall into the very trap he tried to warn them against. Many centuries later, God spoke to the nation through the prophet Jeremiah about how their sin had literally ruined their country, all because of their disobedience and idolatry. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 2.
as I said, God is speaking to them many years later, looking back now. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5, this is what the Lord says. What did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? They worshipped worthless idols, only to become worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us safely out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and death, where no one lives or even travels? And when I brought you into a fruitful land to enjoy its bounty and its goodness, you defiled my land and corrupted the possession I had promised you. Guys, this sounds like it could have been spoken by God directly to America today. Warning us not to let our blessings and prosperity, which he has given us, take our hearts away from him. You see, God knew that prosperity, if not guarded against, leads to apathy. Apathy leads to apostasy, the turning away from God. Apostasy leads to idolatry, the worship of other gods. And in particular, primarily the worship of self. And the result is we begin to take credit for what God has done. You know, it's our strength. Our might, our, our military might, our ingenuity, our resourcefulness and hard work, you know, that uh, are what has made us great as a nation and brought all this prosperity into our lives. Israel felt that same way after a while. And America is there too. We believe because of our capitalistic system, we, be, we gained all this wealth. Because of our military might, we're the strongest nation on the face of the earth. But who gave us the power to get wealth? Or to be strong was the Lord God Almighty. But when, we be t- when a nation begins to take credit for what God has done, then God begins to slide from the consciousness of that nation. And guess what? The first thing to go by the wayside is thankfulness. Thankfulness. And guys, this begins a downward spiral of national decline, where we go from being a thankful people to an entitlement nation, where people no longer appreciate, listen, the gifts God has given us. Underline the word gifts. They no longer appreciate the gifts God has given them, but come to expect and feel they deserve the blessings they have. And when that happens, it becomes impossible for people to enjoy life because, look, almost everybody thinks or believes they deserve more than they have, you know? I mean, if you begin to think you deserve what you have, you know, and and, and all, well, very few people believe that they have uh, everything they deserve. We always think we deserve more. Okay, and um, the result is that when people have that attitude, they become miserable, complaining people who are never satisfied, no matter how much God blesses them with. Christian counselor David, Dale, excuse me, Christian counselor Dr. Dale Robbins writes, and I quote, I used to think people complained because they had a lot of problems, but I've come to realize that they have problems because they complain." Complaining doesn't change anything or make situations better. It amplifies frustration, spreads discontent and discord, and can invoke an invitation for the devil to cause havoc with our lives. Complaining makes us miserable. And then the good doctor quotes Psalm 77, verse 3, which says, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You know, unfortunately, we uh, often don't realize how blessed we are or how thankful we ought to be until the blessings of God are taken from us or are in danger of being taken from us. I'm wondering if this is still in America's future. We think we've gotten a little reprieve. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. And um, it could be that God is about ready to humble America and return us to a place where we begin to appreciate him once again by taking the blessings he has given us so freely away from us to cause us to realize, you know what, we were pretty smug, pretty arrogant. We thought we deserved what we had. We thought it was our strength and so on that gained us all the wealth that we enjoyed. It's good and fitting for Christians, guys, that we learn to be thankful to God every day for every blessing he has given us, whether small or great, everything he so richly pours upon us and not feel that he owes us anything but that everything comes to us as a gift of his grace. Grace means getting what you don't deserve. 
We don't deserve the smallest blessings of God. And yet we think we deserve it all and more. You know, someone has said that gratitude is the source of for all other Christian virtues. Let me say it again. That gratitude is the source for all other Christian virtues. If that is the case, then perhaps we need to reason that ingratitude may well be the source for all, or at least many, of our faults and problems as well. How can we replace a heart of discontent and complaining with a heart of thanks, of thankfulness and contentment? Well, let me just say this, Okay. Uh, in life, attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. One person can look at a glass and see it as half full. Another person can look at the very same glass and see, excuse me. One person can look at a glass and see it half empty. Another person can look at that very same glass and see it half full. What's the difference? It's the same glass. The difference is the perspective each person brings to the situation. This happens all throughout life. There are those who look at their situation like a glass. Um, half empty, you know, like, you know, they're complaining that it's not full, you know. Others look at their lives as a glass, glass half full, thankful that it's not empty, but God has given them some things to rejoice over, many things, okay. Look, the attitude we carry with us through life, this is so important, guys. I believe this is one of the, the major themes Paul was addressing when he talked about uh, us being soldiers, and understanding that we are soldiers, and that how a soldier can have the finest weaponry and armor money can buy, if they don't have the right attitude, they will always be defeated. They have to have an attitude of a soldier, the heart of a soldier. They have to see the fight as something that they must win, no matter what it takes. This is the attitude, this is the perspective we have to bring into the Christian life. The attitude that we carry with us through life is of paramount importance. If we are true to, truly to live lives that demonstrate our gratitude towards God on a daily basis. I mean, do we really perceive the ways that God has blessed us? You know, there's a, a story of how ten lepers came to Christ and um, wanted to be healed. So he told them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were all cleansed of their leprosy. One turned around and ran back to Jesus, fell at his feet, and thanked him for what he had done. He said, where are the other nine? Here, this is a foreigner, the only one who came back to give glory to God. What was the difference? Well, the text says, when he saw he had been healed. The Greek word is ido. It means to see, to understand, and to have thanksgiving. He took a good hard look at himself and said, God has touched me. God has healed me. So a lot of Christians, God is working in their lives every day. God is touching them in some way, blessing them, providing for them. They never see it, though. They're always looking at what they don't have, what they haven't accomplished, and so on. This produces an attitude of ingratitude. And they are the ones who never come back. And thank the Lord for what he has done. They're always, you know, not really seeing their life in the right way. Look, do we really perceive the ways that God has blessed us? I mean, not one of us is hungry. Thank God Sunday we said, look, if anybody is in need and doesn't have money to provide their Thanksgiving meal, we'll take care of it. Nobody came up. We all have money to buy our Thanksgiving dinner. None of us is homeless or, or naked without clothing. And if we're Christians, and I believe everyone in this room is, if we are Christians, we especially have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Listen to me. And somebody told me this years ago, or I heard it on a teaching. If God never gave you and I another thing in the way of a blessing the rest of our lives, we would still be saved. We would still have eternal life. We would still have a place reserved for us in heaven that will never fade away. And in that one regard, we can be thankful to him every single day of our life. But listen to me. The devil will do his best to keep your eyes off of God and the blessings of God. The devil wants you to look at the negative circumstances. The devil wants you to feel sorry for yourself. The devil wants you to look at what's not right, always pointing out what's not right. And, and pretty soon, if that's all we're looking at, that's all we see. We don't see the blessings. We don't see how God is, is in the details even. We just, 
You know, yeah, yeah, it's what I don't have. Well, why do they get to have that and I don't? How come they get a new car and I don't get a new car? Why, why is he doing so well in his business and I'm struggling or out of work or whatever it might be? You see, it's when we begin to realize how much we do have in the Lord. Look, that's when we truly begin to be thankful. And when we're thankful, we've cultivated a heart of thanksgiving. Well, our love for the Lord is going to abound. Because everything we look at is, uh, wow, God is good. God is good. Oh, look at this. God is good. And everything we look at, is a ble- if we see it as a blessing and a gift from God, then pretty soon it's all we're focusing on is how good God is. Our hearts are filled with love for him, for all he has so graciously given us, and the result is a constant sense of joy instead of depression. Look, an unthankful Christian is a miserable, defeated Christian because he or she has lost the perspective of how much God has blessed them with. And when they've lost that perspective, along with it, they lose their joy. How can we cult an attitude of gratitude in life? Let me give you five things real quick. I'm not saying that there aren't others. You could add to the list. Number one, learn to see each new day as a gift from God. Learn to see each new day as a gift from God. So from the time you open your eyes in the morning, even before you get out of bed, thank God for a new day. The Bible says His mercies are new every morning. His promises never fail. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with you all the way through each and every step of the day. Therefore, each new day should be received and entered into as a gift from God. If uh, any of you know any cancer survivors, and maybe some of you in this room uh, are are survivors of cancer, but one of the things that cancer survivors all experience is that they appreciate each new day much more than they ever used to. Because they see each new day as a gift of life that is to be embraced and cherished. Every day is a gift. I don't know what it is. Again, it's not until we're about ready to lose something. And cancer, of course, is the ultimate thief. It will rob you of your life. And um, it's not until people see their life almost taken from them that they begin to cherish every new day. This is the thing we should cultivate as Christians. We should see every new day as a gift from God. Okay, I remember an old Puritan preacher, and they used to like to fire and brimstone a lot when they preached. And this one guy thundered from the pulpit, Thank God in the morning for a new day! Thank Him that you didn't spend last night in hell! Well, that'll get you well woken up, though. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm feeling good about the Lord today. You know, there's a way to look at things, right? I mean, you know. We, uh, we wake up and it's like, oh, what do I have to do today? Or, well, you know, hey, what about what I get to do today? What about what I get to do today? I get to enjoy another day. I get to enjoy my family. I get to enjoy God's blessings. I get to enjoy the fact that, you know what? Even if the Lord took my life today, I'm going to spend eternity with Him. I mean, these are things we have to keep in mind. They're, they're basic, but we lose sight of them, right? Number two. Learn to appreciate the little things in life. It may sound a little trite, but it's nonetheless true. The most important things in life, the most blessed things in life, are the things money can't buy. The older I get, the more I realize how true that is. You know? Uh, The older I get, the more I realize that, you know what, the most blessed things in life are not the new cars or the nice vacations or whatever it might be. It's spending time with family, church family, uh, my flesh and blood family. It's, it's spending time, you know, uh, worshiping with God's people, taking a walk on, a, on, a, on an autumn uh, day, and just, and just breathing in that autumn air and just thanking God for the gift of life that day. Look, so much of life is in the details, you know? As one ancient writer expressed, he said, and I quote, Be thankful, therefore, for the least benefit, and thou shalt be worthy to receive greater. Let the least be unto thee, even as the greatest, and let that which is of little account be unto thee, even as the greatest. If the majesty of the giver be considered, nothing that is given shall seem small and of no worth, for that is not a small thing which is given by the Most High God. It's a good way to look at life. 
So train yourself, guys, to thank God every day for everything, even the small things. Number three. Learn to see the good instead of the bad in things. Oh, this is a, you know, coming from a long line of pessimists, this is a good one for me, okay? I think God has really helped me, but, uh, you know, we, we, a lot of us have a tendency to look at, you know, what's not right, what's bad, instead of focusing on what is good. Again, learn to see the good instead of the bad in things. Look, as somebody has once said, some people could find the manure pile in every field of clover. I mean, you know, if you look hard enough, you'll find something that's a problem or something that's not great. Should we, you know, search, you know, every silver lining to find the cloud? Or just accept what God has given, right? You know, why do we have to look at, you know, maybe you've heard some people say this. Boy, things are really going well. Whoa. I'm waiting for God to really knock me down soon. As if God doesn't want you too happy. As if he blesses you a little bit too much. Oh, i got to slap him down now. You get lifted up with pride, knock you down a little bit. You know, that's not our God, all right? That's not our God. I mean, there are some who are so pessimistic. Again, in their mind, the glass is always half empty, never half full. And once again, guys, life is more a matter of perspective than anything else. I mean, I have seen wealthy people who are miserable, and I've seen poor people that were very happy and content. If that is not a product of your perspective, I don't know what is. Okay? I don't know what is. And that's what the Bible teaches us when it says, you know, how that, you know, let your joy be evident so that when people, you know, uh, when you're going through a trial, what you do is, Paul said, you, you bring it to God, prayer and supplication, okay, with thanksgiving. Uh, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we have a God that we can go to anytime. We have a problem, we bring it to God. We leave it there at the throne. And we just rejoice because he's going to take care of it. And the world looks at that and goes, what in the world is going on with you? I know what's going on. I mean, I know what you're going through. How can you be happy? How can you have joy? Because I have a God who's going to take care of it. I don't worry about things. He's my father. He told me he was going to take care of these things, whatever they might be. You know, when Paul Paul was a master of perspective, I think. And when Paul was a prisoner in Rome, unjustly, by the way, he had done nothing. He would, had been railroaded uh, by the Jews in, in uh, Israel. Uh, became a political pawn for a couple of years, finally appealed his case to Caesar, was sent to Rome where he was under house arrest for a couple of years uh, and uh, and all. But Paul had a perspective that I think was the reason that he was so victorious in life. When he wrote to the Romans, he ended by saying, you know, uh, he didn't say Paul, uh, a prisoner in chains. Lousy, stinking dungeon. Oh, I'm so sick of this. I don't deserve to be here. You know, that kind of thing. No. He didn't call himself a prisoner in chains. He called himself a what? An ambassador in chains. What does that mean? It means I get to do stuff being a prisoner here that I could never do as a free man. I get to witness to everybody, all the guards, right? All the people that work in the prison system, Uh, People I would probably have never had any contact with. God has put me here because he wants me to be a witness. I'm an ambassador in change. What a way to look at your life. He could have been miserable. He could have been full of self-pity. He saw his his being a prisoner there as an opportunity given to him by God to affect these people's lives. And, of course, he wrote to the Philippians. What do you say? Well, you know, Caesar's whole household greets you. Everyone's saved. We having a great time. Fellowship is great. You know, everybody's gotten saved. The guards are Christians now. Wow. Okay. That's, that's an amazing way to look at things. Number four, learn to see the hand of God in everything. You know, this kind of dovetails with what we just said earlier, but uh, Paul said in Ephesians 5, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. In everything, give thanks. This is God's will for you. 
Well, as we have said before, you will never thank God in everything until you first learn to trust God in everything. Of course, you all know Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together, uh, to, uh, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't say we can see all things work together for good. It says we know. The Greek word means intuitively, by faith. Why do we believe that? Because we know our God. As Christians, we believe in a loving, all-powerful God who is in control of the whole universe. That's sovereignty. Sovereignty. A God who claims that he is a good God, who loves us with an everlasting love and has our best interests at heart. So of course, at heart. Of course, the critic responds immediately, well, uh, if uh, that is so, then why do so many bad things happen to those who love God? I mean, if he's a good God and a loving God, I mean, why do so many of his people suffer the way they do? Well, that's a, the question of the ages. And I think uh, J.B. Phillips, who wrote, uh, uh, gave us a paraphrase in the New Testament, I think he put his finger on it. He said, if God were small enough to figure out, he wouldn't be big enough to worship. We want to figure God out. But to really know God completely, you'd have to be God. Because nobody knows the mind of God but God himself. So the idea is like with Job. Job wanted to know why, 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 and God eventually appeared to Job, never answered why he was going through what he was going through. Just took him out a little tour of the universe and showed him all the things God had made, all the things he had created, all the systems that come together, and all the animals and how they were made a certain way, and began to ask Job a series of questions. Do you understand you know, uh, you know, uh, why I made these creatures the way I have? Do you understand uh, the stars and constellations and things, and uh, the whole universe, how it fits together? Do you understand all this of Job? And Job at the end says, no. Uh, you know, uh, Lord, I guess I need to shut up. Uh, you're pretty wise. And so what God did was he never answered Job's why. Why? Because there's always going to be another why. So what God did was he just pointed Job to himself. He said, Job, if you understand me and you trust me, you don't have to know all the whys of life. You'll just trust that I have your best interests at heart. Look, adversities, guys, are used by God to build us. But with many, they make people bitter and not better. It all depends on how we handle them. Again, I see the whole area of perspective coming into view once again. You know, Paul admonished us in uh, 1 Thessalonians, or uh, uh, excuse me, in Ephesians 5. Um, I think I got that wrong. I think it's 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm sorry. But uh, the New King James said, Paul said, in everything give thanks. Uh, in the New Living Translation, it puts it this way. No matter what happens, always be thankful. And notice, once again, Paul didn't say, for everything give thanks. He said, in everything give thanks. It's a lot of things I can't thank God for. But there's nothing I'm going through I can't thank God in the circumstance. Because I trust that he's using it in some way to grow me and um, to equip me to bring him more glory. And guys, the reason we can be thankful in everything is because we know and trust the character and love of our God on our behalf. Again, one of the verses that many of us have memorized, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, God says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good, not for evil or disaster, that you might have a future, to give you a future and to hope. God is saying, guys, you have to trust me because I know what I'm doing. Sometimes the circumstance looks like I don't love you, that I'm not a good God, that I'm taking pleasure in your suffering. You have to know that it is not at all my heart for you. I know the plans that I have for you. They're not always easy. David didn't say he leads us in the easy paths. David said in Psalm 23, he leads us in the right paths, the right paths that will develop our character grow us in Christ, and allowing that which will allow God to use us in greater ways. God says, I know what I'm doing. I am working for your eternal best, not for your temporal comfort. That's the problem. So many Christians are so locked into the temporal, they think God should always be working to bless them and to make their physical life fun, happy, etc. 
where God is working for our, e our eternal best. And if God has to sacrifice some earthly comfort to grow us into the character of Christ more, he'll do that to give us the most blessed eternity possible. And number five, remember that this life is only temporary. Remember this life is only temporary. We're only passing through. Can I have you turn to 2 Corinthians 4, which I believe we read um, not long ago on Sunday morning. But let's read it again. 2 Corinthians 4, starting with verse 16. You know, Paul went through a lot of um, hardships, a lot of persecution. But he wanted to encourage Christians to realize this is all what it means to be a Christian. This is all part and parcel um, with our receiving Christ and walking with him. The world is going to persecute us. Verse 16, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. And guys, what can I say? That is how we um, go from day to day and maintain our joy. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And no, it's not an oncoming train. It's the Lord returning. <laughs> I had a pastor friend of mine who was saying how that, you know, he was going through a kind of a hard time in ministry, and his wife said to him, Now, Dave, remember there is a light at the end of the tunnel. He said, Yeah, well, it's probably a train <laughs> coming to get me. Out. I, I, we all feel like that at times, you know? And God is saying, No, no, it's not a train. Uh, it's me. I'm coming back for you. This is not going to, you know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It, it's temporary. We go through difficult times, uh, but it's not going to go on forever. And that's why Paul said in Colossians 3, verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Look, guys, for, for a Christian, every day ought to be a day of thanksgiving, especially for those of us who live in America. You know, our new president-elect, Donald Trump, has a slogan that he used throughout his campaign, Make America Great Again. Make America Great Again. It reminded me of something I read years ago, um, how that in the 1830s, um, a noted French sociologist and political theorist named Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, he came to America. Why did he come? Well, he wanted to discover the secret of our greatness. He noted in his journal, and I'm quoting, the Americans combine the notion of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and ample rivers, but it was not there. In her fertile fields and boundless prairies, and it was not there. In her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. Not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness that I, did I understand the secret of her greatness and power. Returning to France, he summarized his findings this way. He said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. The only way America will ever be great again, and there are those who would argue with me and say we are great. We've always been great. But can I point them back to Tocqueville? Only when we're good are we great. Are we good? Is America a good country? Oh, we have a lot of good folks in it, and there are good things we do. But we are a, a nation that celebrates perversion and rejoices when the unborn are ripped from their mother's wombs. This is not the attributes of a great nation. This is, these are the, the attributes of a sick nation. 
And the only way America will ever be great again, listen to me, is if we as a people come back to God, the God, listen, who made our nation great in the first place and begin to honor and obey him. And guys, I don't believe that's going to happen until we start to acknowledge once again how dependent we are on him as his people and start being thankful to him once again for every blessing he has given us, both both great and small. I, uh, I'll leave you with the words of President George Washington, who in 1789 issued the first National Thanksgiving Day proclamation. He said, and I quote, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will and to be grateful for His benefits and humbly to implore His protection and favor, Whereas both the houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore... I do recommend next to be devoted by the people of the states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, and that will be, that we may then all unite by rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country, end quote. Think about those words tomorrow when you give thanks for the dinner you're about to receive, that it would go beyond the food, that you would see a nation that was raised up by God out of obscurity to be the strongest and most glorious nation on the face of the earth, a nation that has turned its back on God. I mean, we have churches. We have a lot of people that profess faith. But like Paul said to the Athenians, he said, I, I perceive that you are very religious people. Um, being religious, though, and having a relationship with God are two different things. And uh, we need to come back to him. Uh, I'm thankful for the election. I don't know if everyone in this room is. Uh, I can't tell you that I know that Donald Trump will be a great president or even that he'll be a good president. We are all praying that he would succeed. But I, I warn Christians. I say, look, you know, get your eyes off of Donald Trump. What this nation needs is revival. The only way this nation will be great again is not because Donald Trump makes it great, because Jesus Christ makes it great, because his people, called by his name, have humbled themselves, are seeking his face, praying, and turning, turning from their wicked ways. As he promised us in Second Chronicles 7.14, then I will hear their prayers from heaven. I will heal, uh, forgive their sins and heal their land. This is what we need, guys. Pray for our president-elect. Pray for his cabinet. Pray for wisdom to be given to him to fill all the positions that of the important uh, people that surround him. Pray for his safety and our vice president-elect. But we need to cry out to God. We, what we need is for the pulpits of America to once again be aflame with righteousness. Not with this mealy, uh, politically correct garbage we see where it's all about placating people to build big churches instead of preaching God's word and truth to penetrate hearts and things. May God give us grace. I pray there is one last great revival and awakening God has for America before the end. And uh, let's pray that that would be a reality because only then will America become great because America will once again be good, a nation under God, which is what made us great in the first place. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your many great blessings and gifts of grace you have given to us. Lord, we deserve nothing. You have given us all things. We are an incredibly prosperous nation, yet our prosperity has led to apathy, apathy to apostasy, an apostasy to idolatry. And now, Lord, we stand on the precipice of judgment unless this nation turns around 
gets on its knees and comes back to you. Father, please, we deserve judgment. Please, Lord, give us mercy and a great awakening and a revival that will sweep across every corner of this nation, Lord, bringing millions to Christ before the end for the rapture. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, give us grace to uh, cultivate an attitude of gratitude. That's what we need. We need to look, Lord, at every single, every breath your word says is a gift from you. Every beat of our heart is a gift. Lord, help us to, to wake up every morning. And the first thing we do is we say, thank you, Lord, that I have another day to enjoy your blessings, to be a light. Another day, Lord, to be an instrument in your mighty hands for good. We just thank you, Lord. Father, we ask all these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.